Kokice. My Italian is terrible, but I've done some other good things. <laughs> I'm working on React, I'm working on open source, and I'm working on making my own products. So from some of the open source projects that I have are custom React scripts, which is an alternative to React scripts that you use in Create React app. You can plug in a bunch of custom things like decorators and so on. Uh, I have Mobix router, which is a router, simple router for Mobix apps. And for the products I've made, some of the most recent and popular ones are OK Google I.O., which is an interactive list of commands for the Google Assistant, uh, CZ.co, which is an app to uh, preview and test responsive websites on multiple devices at once, and the latest one is reactacademy.io. So I'm doing React and JavaScript on-site workshops, so if you know a company or a conference that needs workshops in like React, React Native, Redux, Mobix, whatever, you can just contact me. And you can find more about me at kitsa.io. My username is like kitsa on GitHub. It's kitsa on Medium. But it's the kitsa on Twitter because some idiot like tweeted twice, took the nickname, and never appeared again. <laughs> All right. So today we're going to talk about the horrible Dropbox redesign. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're going to talk about state management in a, don't take pictures, <laughs> they're going to kill me. State management in a GraphQL era. So, First, let's explain like what is state management, client state management, and what do we do for now. So these are all the bits and pieces that we need for client state management, but these are the small ones. So we have like forms, we have routing, inputs, tabs, filters, date pickers, menus, checkboxes, navigation, everything else, so I, I call them the small parts. The big part that is complicating state management is data. So that's why it's taking like a, it, it has a bigger font here, because managing data into the client state of our app, it's pretty horrible, and it got horrible after we introduced like single page apps. So in my opinion, single page apps literally ruined everything. Everything that was nice in web development, it went downhill after introducing single page app. So we were aiming for a faster car, but we ended up with that thing, whatever it is, like bunk bed, car, on hot wheels, whatever. So the idea of having the, the client do everything and just, just put everything in the bundle and then we store the data, we need state management. I think it wasn't going in the right direction, but let's go back and let's see how I wrote my first single page app. This is me writing my single, like, single page app in jQuery, so it was all spaghetti code, it was pretty terrible. And we had like one main.js file with around 3,000 lines of code. So it wasn't separated into files, there was no importing, like everything was there. We were fetching a JSON file that was like one megabyte. So we fetched like the whole database, just give me the whole database and screw it, I don't need to fetch like bits and pieces. So we fetched the whole data, we had a huge bundle. It, it did state management, it did UI manipulating with jQuery, data fetching, like caching, whatever. It had a whole freaking like calendar plugin in between of the code. So you have like jQuery code, you have comment, calendar starts here, and then you close that and you continue with your code. So it was, the irony is like, it's still live. It's like used by the h h government of health in Macedonia. So a lot of people are using it, up to, but it's horrible to maintain. Like I'm glad that I'm not maintaining that anymore. Um, then we moved on to Angular 1, but I'm afraid to give it a number because now it's just Angular or 7 or whatever version they have. And I, I liked it really much because all the problems that I had with like jQuery and state management, which was pretty impossible to do, suddenly were solved by the idea of components and directives and everything. But it's funny how sometimes we dive so deep into these technologies and it all makes sense in our head until we explain it to a friend or a colleague or someone. So when I explained Angular 1 to a, to a friend, I was like, it's pretty clear in my head. And I was like, don't worry, that's just a service. We're going to inject it into our directive, which is actually using a controller. But don't worry, we, we can use factories here. And factories are just like, it's like services, but it's different. And, and then I was like, holy crap, we're, this is pretty bad. So even if I cannot explain it, new, newcomers who will come to this framework won't know how to use the state. Like if I grab some data, do I put it in the factory? Do I put it in the controller? Do I cache it? So it was, I liked it, but I was looking for a better solution all the time. And I found React, but I won't dwell on the fact that it's so great because we're here at a React conference, it's great, we all know it, yada yada, all right. So when I, when I wrote my first React app, I was actually trying to be too smart. I was using this dot set state for state management, obviously, but I didn't like my first network request. I was using fetch or axios or I don't know what. And when I was fetching them, I was like, I don't want this loading speeder all the time here, so I'm gonna be really smart and write my own cache mechanism 
to when I, I cached, that was the key. So the key to my caching was API slash posts. So I said like, if I ever fetch slash API slash post and I fetch this same route, the next time I'm gonna cache it. So it was pretty stupid. And I ended up with like, after experimenting with it, I ended up with the same thing that I had in jQuery. So I just loaded everything because I couldn't, it was a pretty small app and I couldn't bother with composing all the network requests and caching, so I just loaded everything at once. I was trying because set state doesn't scale and <laughs> I'm just joking, it totally scales. But at the time I, I, I totally believe the hype about Redux, which is, yeah, it seems pretty simple. And I believe in the hype, and I wanted to refactor my whole app by using Redux. And we were doing all the same things. And my relationship with Redux is basically I love Redux and I hate Redux at the same time. I love it because the concept behind it is like, it's really simple and genius at the, set, and at the same time. So there's a reason why it caught on so much. Because I like all the concepts, I like what it introduced, but I don't like it is because multiple reasons. Number one is all the boilerplate that it introduced to my apps, so I had to write like seven files to do one thing. And the second thing that I hated about it is the hype. So even for developers who are just starting with React, everyone is pushing them to go into like use Redux. So I had a friend who I, who I told, like we were talking and he was like, I want to learn React Native and I was reading about it last night, but I got stuck on Redux. I'm like, how? <laughs> so he was trying to learn React Native and he got stuck on Redux. That shouldn't be a sentence, you know? And I hate the hype, but if you don't trust me that it's overhyped, let's, let's read what the creator of it has to say. Haha, -ha, no hard feelings. It's definitely overhyped, low level and often unnecessary. So he even wrote an article, you might not need Redux, which to me, I have massive respect for that, but it's also ridiculous. It's like a band releasing an album and saying, don't listen to this, it's, you, don't, you can listen to something better. But he's right, you might, need, you might not need Redux. I hate this sentence. I read a Reddit thread and someone, like a beginner, a red beginner was asking, hey guys, I wrote my first app, now how do I fetch data? And the first comment was, just use Redux Saga. <laughs> like, <laughs> you, don't, you don't say just re use Redux Saga. That cannot be a sentence. You don't say just use Redux, just use. Because that's the same as your friend is calling, hey, there is a spider in my house. And you're like, just I will come there with a bazooka, just with a bazooka, or with a rocket launcher. So it's, it's ridiculous. Like, we are all, all into this hype about Redux and Sagas and whatever. So this was me explaining Redux to a colleague. So I, I was really high on that train. I was like, no state management framework ever will replace Redux in my brain, right? And my friend is like, let's write an app, and the state management of it will be, we'll push a bunch of people into an array, and then we will randomize the names, and the, we will choose one person, and that person will make the coffee for the whole company. I was like, genius idea, we'll be millionaires. Let's do it. And he said, yeah, let's just write it in like seven lines of jQuery, because I'm like, no, 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 we need Redux. We'll, we'll just do it in React and Redux, I'm gonna teach you, it's awesome, it's gonna be amazing. And we're sitting in the restaurant, the restaurant closed by the time we were, from the time we entered, by the time I explained Redux to him, the restaurant literally told him, guys, you need to leave. That cannot happen. So I, as I was explaining the concept of pushing things into a array just to store them, and then we have three different files for doing this, I was like, dude, I'm gonna close my laptop now and tomorrow I'm gonna find an alternative solution to state management and we're gonna talk again. So the next day, that was the first time I, ex I explored MobX. And for me, it was like, I did it, I don't know, in like 10 minutes after reading the documentation, I did that, just pasted to him and he was like, aha, this makes more sense to me. So I don't wanna go into like framework where what is better for, for, for state management, but for me, that was a situation that when I switched from Redux to MobX, I never went back to, to actually need Redux in my apps. But this world about frameworks and about which state management tool and about which library began like a zillion years ago. So we have like jQuery versus Mutus, we have Angular versus Ember, we have Kill versus Rest, Redux versus Mobex, React versus Vue, Apollo versus Relay, and Hillary versus Trump. So we always have like this battles of what is better. <laughs> But the mistake we're all doing here is because we're asking what is better. That's a really wrong question to ask. People shouldn't fight like which framework is better, which state management framework is better for me. You should be asking what's suitable for my app, uh, what's suitable for my team, and what's suitable for my use case. But you shouldn't say what's better. Because I have an opinion, Trump is great, right? Do you agree? No, of course you don't agree. But he's great on a golf court. 
So if you put him as a president of the United States, he's pretty terrible. But on a golf course, he may be great. So that's the same question that, that we have to ask about, is Redux great? Yeah, if you put it in the right context, in the right company, in the right number of developers working on an app, it can be great. Same for MobX, same for React, for Vue, for Angular, for whatever. So, and same with state management apps. Makes sense, right? So, data is the number one reason why state management is hard. Like, from the first moment I did my first API call, I was like, this is going to be hell. So why? Because we have to fetch the data, we have to store the data, we have to read the data, we have to keep it in the cache, we have to be clever about what do we refetch, and so on and so forth. So let's show a little bit of code. So here we have an asynchronous action from Redux about fetching some to-dos. So we're dispatching one action to, initial, to say that we initialize the network request. We, have, uh, we are dispatching a second action that's saying we we got a successful network request, or we have a third action that's saying this is going to fail. So we have like, I don't know, seven lines, eight lines of code to do one API request. And when I saw it, I was like, yeah, pretty great. But when you do it for 19 API requests, we're like, hmm, maybe we can do something smarter here. I don't know. And this was just the first part. Now we have the reducer where we actually need to read from that data and read from the action and do something based on that action. So we have a bunch of more code. What is going to happen to the state when we fetch some data and so on? And I don't disagree with the whole logic we have in Redux, but I would like to separate the data fetching and the data storing part, and maybe we have a smarter solution for that. Before we go there, let's show the same thing in Mobex. So for Mobex, we only have one slide, because you can fit all the code in one slide. You have a class of app, we have three observables, to-dos, loading, and error. You're having an action called fetch to-dos. You fetch them, and then you toggle a bunch of these booleans, or you put the array. Like, you can read more of it in one slide. But can we fit even more? Can we do more with less? Yes, by using GraphQL. I just want to ask who is using GraphQL as an experiment and a, as a serious app and like a production app? Wow, all right. <laughs> so GraphQL is good because it's allowing um, us to compose multiple pieces of data together while taking care of fetching, storing, reading. So it's taking care of everything that I hear about state management. GraphQL has taken care of me. So let's show an example. We have also one slide, but in this slide, we managed to fit like a query and a React component. So it, it's this simple. For, for this example, uh, there are multiple ways to, to use GraphQL and React, but I'm just using Apollo. So this is an example of just fetching a query of to-dos where we have title and date, attaching it to our component, and then our component magically is receiving these props. Is the network request loading? Is it loaded? Does it have an error? And it simplifies the job that we previously have to do a lot. So the problem that we had is we were fixing the sync instead of fixing the well. That was the problem in state management apps. We were fixing the wrong thing. You would ask, what is the sync, what is the well? The sync is state management, and the well were the REST APIs. So we were actually, in our heads, we were solving state management by throwing all these different libraries together. But what we did, actually, we had a problem with REST APIs, because they're not flexible enough. They don't allow you to compose whatever you need. You cannot fetch on the front end whatever you need. So you have to be smart. Uh -huh, do I have to call three REST APIs here? Or can we create a new one called fetch to do and categories, and the mother of my children, and whatever? So we ended up with this huge REST API names instead of trying to fix, by, fix it by replacing REST with GraphQL. So, the question is, as the, title of my, as, as the title of my talk is, do we even need a state management library, like an external one, when we're using GraphQL? And my reaction is literally this guy. So it's like, uh, maybe we need it, maybe we don't, but it, it really depends on the context. So as, as I told you, everything, don't listen to what I say. Like, don't go home and do like, oh, GraphQL is the best. Like, if REST APIs work for you, then they work for you, and you don't have to switch to anything else. But there are different contexts where we can use GraphQL with a state management library or without it and it's gonna be a, a win for our team. So let's go back to one slide that I had about what is state management on the client. So we have like all these small parts, and then we have the data. And now with GraphQL and using the library like Apollo, what we end up with, we just remove the data, and now we are, we're, we're stuck with this. So it's just the simple parts, right? Deciding how, how do we do the rest of the small things, it's really up to us, but I'm gonna give you a few ideas so you can see how you can do it. But before that, if you ask, you really remove that big data text, right? How, does, how much code can it remove if you repl replace, let's say, Redux with Apollo in an app? So I have an example from Peggy Raises. She's working on a team, I, I don't remember the app, but she had this screenshot posted where they removed, you can see there in the magnifier, they removed around 5,000 lines of code. 
So that was like all the actions, all the reducers, all of the boilerplate, they literally removed it, replaced it by GraphQL and Apollo, and they ended up with extra 1,000 lines or something. But it's still a huge win not to think about all of these things. So when you onboard a new developer, he will also have an easier time. Um, so let's show some of the stacks I will suggest and explain to you about how you can combine GraphQL something else. So here are the names that I chose for the stacks. The first one is vanilla. Second one is I hate forms. Third one is my users live in tunnels. Fourth one is I want to go home early. Fifth one is next level. And sixth one is just Apollo. So I will go and explain them one by one. So the first one is vanilla. What do we need for this stack? We need only Apollo to to take care of the GraphQL data and so on. We need a router library for using routing if you want, otherwise you can, if it's one page app, you don't even need a router. And then you can use just set state. So all of your components can use set state. You don't have complex data fetching stuff. So you can, for switching tabs and whatever, you can just use local state. You don't even need an external state library. Second one is a hate forms. So this one, you may pick it if you have like a really complex forms, you have like nested forms, you have a lot of forms, basically you hate forms. And I would advise you to use like a library like Formic, and I cannot remember names, there are plenty of React form libraries that may make your life easier if you, if you have really complex forms. Here's a third one called my users live in tunnels. So it's using Apollo, it's using router, it's using Redux, and it's using Redux offline. So why did I call it like this? Because you can assume if you're using Redux offline, where we have users who wants to use our app in an, I don't know, in a, in a train or somewhere where we don't have internet connection. So this can be a big win for us if we combine Redux with Apollo with Redux offline. But why? Apollo 1.0 is using Redux under the hood. So basically, what they did is they, they used the power of Redux, is how easy it is to like do complex things with it, but they don't give you the they they don't give you the, the hard job for you to do it, but they did it under the hood. So basically for storing the data that you fetch from GraphQL, they just manage it within their own Redux store. But what they allow you to do is here, you can combine your reducers from Redux with their Apollo reducer, and along with the middleware that you that you compose, you can get a big win by combining Apollo. Alright. And into a Redux store. So now what we see here is an, uh, an existing Redux store, and on the left you can see we have all of the actions for, for the client state, like increment, decrement, and so on. I have them here. But we also have like Apollo query in it, Apollo query error, and so on and so forth. And on the right we can inspect them in the Redux dev tool. So this is a pretty, pretty huge win. But what happens if we also plug in Redux offline? So we can get offline support for GraphQL queries in just a few-ish lines. So because of the store of Apollo is written in Redux, we can just plug Redux offline to it. And just like that, we will have offline. The data will be stored in our local storage. So let's show how does that look like. You can see here we're, we're plugging another thing called offline. We're doing a few more things in the configuration there. But this is enough to give you like offline support for your data. So whenever you fetch your to-dos, they'll be stored in your uh, local storage. And next time you refresh the app, they'll be read from your local storage if the user doesn't have connection, which is a pretty big win if you do it like in five minutes. It's pretty good. The problem with combining Redux and um, Apollo is offline mutations. So if you want to change some data, it's not that easy. It's, not, it's definitely not five lines. It's more complex. So if you use Redux offline, you need to mark mutations as pending, and you have to retry when the network is available. But you cannot listen to this action because the network requests are like swallowing the first action and so on. So this is what you have to do to actually wrap a GraphQL mutation in a Redux action, which I, which I hate. Like this, is, this is like going back to jQuery. Because instead of me just using my simple mutations, what I have to do now is to wrap each one of them into, into another like additional Redux action, which is, the, which is, in my opinion, we're going in the wrong di direction because we wanted to simplify everything, and now we need to wrap every mutation into this. So to sum up, the pending mutations that we want to do, like, I don't know, update to do, we need to store them into a store, into an array, and then when the network comes back, what we have to do is just send them to the network one by one. But we're storing them into our own Redux store. We're not modifying the Apollo store, which just by doing that, you're already creating a mess. You don't have a single truth, but you have two truths, like the Redux store and the Apollo store. And we have to wrap all of our mutation in Redux actions, and we have to do a lot of manual work to handle like optimistic responses and so on. So this is not going in the right direction. 
I will talk later about the Polar Link Offline, which in my opinion is the solution that we needed. You just plug it in, you get offline support for mutations and queries, it works like magic. So the last two stacks that I have is, this one is called I Wanna Go Home Early, and it's using Apollo, Mobix, Mobix React Form, and Shameless Plug My Own Router. So we're using this on a, on a stack in our, in our company, and it proved to be pretty well because we don't need offline support, we don't need any magic library for doing like offline mutations and stuff. So Apollo is taking care of the data, Mobix is taking care of the forms or of, of everything else, and it worked pretty great for us. The next one is Next Level. Sorry for the pun, because of Next.js, it's called Next Level. And it's using Apollo, Next.js, and Set State. So this is server-side rendered. And I don't know if you have experience with Next.js, I won't go deep into that. But I will suggest you to do something crazy, which people will be like, that's not possible. Use full page reloads when navigating between routes. Like, why would that be bad? You don't have to stick to your single page app. If you go to big websites like, I don't know, Amazon or whatever, you will see that sometimes, most of the time, they're doing a full page refresh when navigating from home to your cart but you don't notice that because you're too deep into your single page apps mentality, right? So I would suggest you to try this because I'm experimenting with this on a project where I'm treating every route as a separate mini app. So when I'm navigating, these are the routes, and I'm navigating from my app to post or from post to another post, instead of that being on the client, I just use a full page reload, and then it simplifies state management so much because it's e easier to, to reason about. And the last stack I have is just Apollo. So is it possible to have state management only by using Apollo, not using Mobex, not using Redux, not using even set state, not using anything, just Apollo? So for now it's not, but they're going in the right directions with Apollo 2.0. So with Apollo 2.0, what we have is it's faster, up to 10 times. It's smaller, around 40%. It's not using Redux under the hood, which is also a big win. If you're not using Redux, why include that in your bundle? It, it's, it has increased flexibility by using Apollo Link. So what is that? Before, here's how we initialize the GraphQL store. So we're saying, new Apollo client, and we pass in the network interface, a URL, and we have no more configuration. But with 2.0, what they did is we're importing three different things. The Apollo client is this lightweight little layer, and then on top of it, we have like HTTP link and in-memory cache, which are two separate libraries. So now, here's where, where the magic happens, in these two lines. So now when I'm initializing my Apollo client, I can say, use this library for fetching my data, and use this library for storing the cache. So now they're opening their cache, so instead of writing it in Redux, you can write your own cache implementation, which is really powerful. So for now, uh, I don't know whether it's a guy or a company, but he, he released something that's faster than the initial Apollo cache. So they released a, a Apollo cache Hermes, which is like really, really faster. And I really hope that in the future we will see like Apollo 2.0 isn't released yet, but I hope that we're gonna see implementations for storing data into Mobex or into Mobex state tree, because now they're allowing that. I'm gonna finish by talking about Apollo Link Local. So this is the solution that might allow you to, that may allow you to use only GraphQL for state management and nothing else, but something called schema stitching. So in Apollo now they're experimenting with schema stitching, which allows you to fetch data from your server, from Foursquare API, and also from the client. So your component will just say, I need this, 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 and that, and schema stitching will figure out, aha, this part I need it from the API server, this part is coming from the client, like a counter or which tab is selected, and that part is coming from Foursquare API. But it's really powerful because your component is just describing I need this and that. It doesn't care where does it come from, and by schema stitching, you will stitch your server schema with your client schema, they will work together. Not sure how will that look like, we have a state, and then we're writing schema for our client. It may look a little bit weird. It may look a little bit weird. So we're defining a schema, we have a simple counter, and then we're gonna define like queries and mutations to manipulate that counter. But this is only on the client. It doesn't send anything on the network. And it's pretty cool because now when I'm using my to-dos component, and let's say I need to fetch my to-dos, but I also wanna see which tab is active, which page is active on the router, which are current params for the router, and whatever. I can just do it in the same query. So this is my component, and here I'm fetching something from the server, and I'm fetching something from the, from the client. So I think th this is a really big win, because we don't have to separate client state management and server, everything is just into, into one query. So how can you start by adopting in this in your app? You can start with incremental adoption, so you start from bottom up, you start with some simple pieces of state, and you can keep both the libraries until you completely refactor everything, That's not a bad thing, I've kept like three different CSS and JS libraries into my production app, no one even noticed. So keep Apollo, Redux, Mobix together until you figure out and you refactor to Redux, and I wish you good luck. 
Thank you very much for listening.